Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze, the show where one of my writers, in this case Kevin, has written me a script, America's most questionable legal loopholes. Oh, here we go. I feel like in America, there's that, like, you know, the more expensive your lawyers, the more crimes you can get away with. Uh, it's like, you just hear about, like, crazy shit that's going on and people getting away. Like, OJ fucking Simpson. Like, what the fuck? He's just... Yeah, not guilty. Not guilty. Despite everything. And obviously, he's not guilty of the murder. I feel like he was guilty of crimes later, right? They got him on some other shit. And he went to prison for a while, but now he's out of prison. And that's weird. Okay, the format of the show. I've never read this before. We're going to read it together. Let's just jump in. Laws are the very foundation of any civilized society. Without laws, we're nothing more than animals. But that doesn't mean we can't use the law to our advantage. Many statutes are ambiguously or poorly written, allowing for a variety of incredible, crazy, and sometimes questionable legal loopholes. And in any... And in case you were a... And in... And in a case... Try control off delete Jiggle the cord. Turn him off and on. Clean the gook out of the mouse. Call technical support. And in case any of you were about to get your hopes up, I'm not trying to teach you how to get away with not paying your taxes. Damn it, Kevin! The one reason we're here is true that there are plenty of questionable and exploitable loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stumble over your words too early in the video, Simon. Let's go. Uh, in tax law, but either you're too poor to utilize them or your accountant is already doing it for you. Yes, please. Honorable mention. Life drawing class. I feel like something is missing, don't you? We're starting with the honorable mention. Okay. Chris Teague was just a humble small business owner living in Boyce, which I think is pronounced Boise, but it's like Boyce. Idaho. And having worked for a small business, I can tell you there is nothing more frustrating than having to deal with the local government. There's nothing more frustrating than having to deal with local government, whether you're a small business or not. It's local government. Their business is frustration. I spent a year, a year, getting permits to, like, put a back door on my house so I could access my garden. A year. And then I spent, I'm st it's, it's been over a year, and I'm still waiting for permission to build a garage. I had a garage that looked like it was a piece of shit, like a standalone garage next to the house. It was this ugly thing, like really horrible add-on later, like someone built just on the cheap piece of crap. Got permission to demolish it. <laughs> We're waiting months for permission to build another garage in its place. Now there's just a pile of rubble and the government's like, mm, we'll see about that. They've vaguely given me permission. They're just like, there's some paperwork that's got. It's insane. Local small government, it, a local government is insane. Please don't watch this local government and then drag the process on even longer because that would be really upsetting. I'm already upset. <laughs> and it's so expensive because you have to send them such detailed plans. Like, no, you, no, you, you're building a garage, it's not complicated. And the plans that I have for this are insane. It's so detailed. Cities and towns pass the most insane and restrictive requirements on local businesses. And as far as I can tell, the only reason to do this is to piss people off. Bingo. In our case, the problem arose when the owners wanted to redo the facade of the store. It was an old building that needed a whole new front, but the town refused to let us renovate. The original building had a step leading to the door, but the town required any new or remodeled storefronts to have a ramp for wheelchair accessibility. That's not unreasonable, and it's one reason we were happy to oblige, except that the angle of the slope that they were demanding would have made the ramp go halfway across the street. Again, this was to replace a single step. It created a months-long standoff before the town council finally relented on their asinine nonsense and let us build a normal ramp to the sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? The other option is not renovate it, and then there remains a step which wheelchairs can't get up. So, like, what the f***? But for Chris, the city ordinance in question was much more than an annoying delay. In 2001, Boise had passed a law forbidding complete nudity in public. Seems remarkably sensible. I, I, I don't think people should just be walking about fully naked. Peasant Philistine. That seems like a terrible idea to just allow that. Something that negatively affected his ability to run his small business, Erotic City Strip Club. Oh, well, th that's not in public. That's in a strip club. If you go to a strip club, what are you f***ing expecting? That's obviously different. The strippers were no longer able to get fully nude, which is obviously disastrous for that particular industry. Lucky for Chris, a customer was going to accidentally give him the solution to his problem. One day, a customer requested to come in free of charge so that he could sketch the dancers. Ah, it's gonna be, ah, I get it, like live drawing. It's like, there was one of those ones in the UK, like when they had the smoking ban, and people started up uh, smoking research centers in pubs. Whereas like, yeah, you come in, say you're part of this research to do with smoking and then people would just be smoking. And then I think they got rid of that. But it's like, yeah, 
like neat little way around a smoking van. <laughs> I am in flavor country. Before we continue with today's video, I want to tell you about our most wonderful of sponsors, and that would be Squarespace. Why? Why is Squarespace so fantastic? Well, they are the ultimate all-in-one platform for anyone looking to stand out and succeed online, whether you are a budding entrepreneur or if you're already managing a booming brand, in which case get back to work now. Squarespace is here to make your online world easy. Squarespace offers a ton of fantastic features, and the standout feature for me has to be Fluid Engine. It's like having a magic wand for web design. You start with a top-notch template and then sprinkle your creativity in with a reimagined drag-and-drop interface. And voila, your website dreams have come true. Thank you, Squarespace. You are truly a gift from the gods. Plus, their flexible website templates are the perfect outfit for your website. Start with a pro template, customize it to fit your style, add any feature you want, and boom, diddle boom you are done and squarespace just dropped courses as well you now create and sell your online courses start with the pro layout upload videos customize with a fluid engine editor and set your price turn your knowledge into income with squarespace courses soon i'm going to be launching my own course all about the cultivation of cut just joking but here's the deal head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch your online empire go to squarespace.com slash blaze to save 10 percent of your first purchase of a website or a domain using the promo code blaze and now back to today's video i don't know why you thought that would work but it did give chris an idea the law granted an exception for displays that had serious artistic merit so he was going to turn his dancers into life drawing models for a 15 dollars charge customers could come to erotic city strip club for an art club night Night. Upon entry, they would receive a pencil and a sketch pad to draw the fully nude dancers. Chris even hung some of the drawings on the walls. I'm gonna put it right here, right on the refrigerator. That way we'll get to see it every day. All right! So either some of the perverts were really good artists, or he just wanted to make the whole operation seem more legitimate. I'm gonna guess it's the latter. It's a really clever plan, but it only gets an honorable mention because it didn't actually work. Oh no! But the, the, the merit! The artistic merit! After this story made international news back in 2005, the business was raided and shut down. Holy sh government, chill the f out. It's a strip club. Like, what? who is it hurting? Maybe strippers? <laughs> I don't know. Look, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just think it should be allowed. I think it just should be allowed. <laughs> What's the problem? It turns out that there was more text to the law that Chris hadn't bothered to read. While it was true that there was an exception to nudity laws that even extended to dancers, for example, in a theatre setting, that exception did not apply to adult businesses. It was a good idea. Well, just say you're not an adult business anymore. It's, no, it's not a strip club. It's an art studio. It's a theatre. What happens there? Uh, yeah, we just draw naked ladies. Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Chris, better call Simon. It was a good idea, but in order to fully utilize this loophole, he would have had to rename his business to Erotic City Family Pizza Fun Time or something like that. Yeah, which uh, he should have done. Go ahead, make my day. All of the best laws have nicknames. There are Romeo and Juliet laws, stand your ground laws, and in Colorado, there's the make my day law. Okay, let's go. This law gets its name from the movie Sudden Impact in a scene which Clint Eastwood, playing Dirty Harry, guns down a diner full of criminals. Oh my god, I haven't seen this movie. Oh, shocker. It sounds kind of fun. So probably not the best basis for a legal doctrine. The law is an extension of castle doctrine, but it is pretty extreme. The law states that any occupant of a dwelling is justified in using any degree of physical force, including deadly physical force, against someone that has unlawfully entered their home so long as they reasonably believe that the person has committed or will commit another crime and that the intruder might use any physical force, no matter how slight, against any occupant. It's slightly confusing, isn't it? But that basically means if someone breaks into your house and you're a bit scared that they're going to hurt you, you can shoot them. Okay. Very American right there, isn't it? Should that happen, the occupant is immune from any criminal or civil prosecution for their use of physical force. You don't even need to assume that they're armed or anything like that. If someone breaks into your house in Colorado and you catch them stealing your TV, so long as you think that they might slap you, you're legally justified in straight up murdering them. That's up colorado how about you don't have that law it seems a little bit insane it seems so unnecessary well, that's what we call overkill what we call a psychotic and it seems like also america you've got loads of guns so is there just no crime in colorado because surely no one would risk that but i'm gonna guess that obviously people do and then they get killed and those people get away with killing someone which is mad 
don't do that. That shouldn't be allowed. I get wanting the ability to protect yourself and your property, but this law feels far too broadly sweeping. Yes, it does, Kevin. I'm sure it was constructed in this way to ensure that it would be impossible for a criminal to sue their intended victim for bodily injury, but I like to think there would be a better way. However, regardless of your feeling on the use of force to defend your property, the law was still much broader than intended. The word dwelling seemed self-explanatory. Whether igloo, hut, or lean-to, or a geodesic dome, there's no structure I have been to which I'd rather call my home. And as such, lawmakers didn't feel the need to properly define it in the statute. Uh-oh, you should always be defined. Like, if you're doing law, always go err on the side of extra certainty. Because law's all about certainty. And if it doesn't, if it feels just a little bit blurry, throw a few extra legal words in there. Go into ChatGPT and be like, can you make this a little more airtight? And ChatGPT will be like, certainly, blah, 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 blah. Done! Easy! Loopholes closed before they were even open! What didn't occur to them was that there were over 2,500 inmates that could legitimately claim Sterling Correctional Facility in Sterling, Chicago as their dwelling. Wait, what's gonna happen? And Sterling isn't some white collar resort here. The prison is home to mass murderers and death row inmates. Oh, it's big boy prison. <laughs> I always think of big boy prison and Bernie Madoff prison. Like, you know, white collar prison and like blue collar prison what's the like look the, the murdery prison i'm not sure why it took two years but in 2013 antero alanis and his cellmate were charged with the 2011 murder of another inmate cleveland flood cleveland was found dead in antero's cell after having been stabbed over 90 times jesus christ overkill much overkill. However, Antero claimed that Cleveland entered his cell without their consent and that he was armed with a shank. Antero's lawyers argued that his prison cell constituted a dwelling, thus making him immune from prosecution, and a judge consequently threw out the charges. God damn, okay. The case was naturally appealed by prosecutors, but on June 30, 2016, the District Court of Appeals upheld the decision to dismiss the charges. Look, I mean, I think the law's a little bit insane, but this is a pretty fair interpretation of the law. This loophole had accidentally legalized murder in prison, a disastrous unintended consequence. No more so than it legalizes murder in people's homes. Like, I'm not sure what the difference is. A, a, a prison cell is a dwelling, and if someone comes in there and, you know, to mess it up and possibly hurt you, then uh, isn't that the same as someone coming in to nick your TV? I, it's legalized murder outside of prison as well, which seems just equally insane. But don't get any ideas if you find yourself headed to prison in Colorado. Just 10 days after the original decision was upheld, the law was revised to add a single sentence specifying that detention facilities do not count as dwellings. The loophole may be closed now, but they can't retroactively take away Antero's total immunity for the 90 plus stab wounds. Frogs are frogs, and fish is fish. As everybody knows, tomatoes are fruit. They come from the flower. <laughs> Hang on a second, Kevin. They come from the flowering plant of a part of a plant, and they have seeds. Ergo, they are botanically defined as being fruit. Chill. I mean, look, tomatoes. What is the context that most people are familiar with tomatoes? It's not biology. It's in food. And culinarily, culinarily, culinary, food-wise, tomatoes are a vegetable, and everyone knows that. No one's like, oh, that's actually a fruit. And if you are saying that, you're a knob. No offense, Kevin. I don't mean that to you personally. You're probably guessing I've already gone on this tangent, aren't you, Kevin? Let's just read and see where you're at. I'm sure some of you are annoyed by that statement. <laughs> same page. But it's a fact whether you like it or not. However, according to the United States Supreme Court, tomatoes are a vegetable. Oh my god, who cares? Why are you wasting time on this? Because it's fun. You see, the US government has this incredible ability to warp reality to fit its own needs. I reject your reality and substitute my own. In the case of Nix and Hedden back in the 1890s, the Supreme Court stated that even though tomatoes are fruits as a matter of fact, they would legally be classified as vegetables for the purpose of tariffs and custom. It's an entertaining ruling and a fun bit of trivia, but it pales in comparison to a California ruling from last year that was later upheld by their state Supreme Court. Over the past several years, you've probably heard a lot about saving the bees. Yeah, I have. But I still see bees fucking everywhere. It's like, there's plenty honey. Why don't just relax? The bees are fine. They're probably not fine, are they? How about a suicide pact? How do we do it? I'll sting you, you step on me. That just kills you twice. The bees are disappearing and we're all gonna starve to death. 
Save the bees. I'm not sure exactly when this became a big issue, but the bit Black Mirror episode involving robot bees aired all the way back in 2016, so bee populations must have been in jeopardy for at least that long. There's the Federal Endangered Species Act. But states can have their own lists of endangered species as well. And California has the cleverly titled uh, 9 out of 10 California Endangered Species Act, or CESA. CESA allows anybody to petition the commission to add a species to their list of threatened or endangered species. And in 2018, that's exactly what the Xerxes Society did. The society sought to add four species of bumblebees to the state's list of endangered animals, so they took a look at CESA's rules to see if insects were allowed on the list. Their policy stated that the protection statutes extended to native species or subspecies of a bird, fish, amphibian, reptile, or plant. That didn't bode well for the bumblebees, but the law didn't actually define any of those terms. Maybe they could find something on that list that could theoretically include bees. With, with, the, with the goal of what? No one's out hunting fucking bees. No one's, like, purposefully exterminating bees, are they? Like, isn't I don't know why the bees are disappearing. Does is this this is just one of those news articles that you see pop up on like the news occasionally. You see a title, it's like bees are in danger, and it's just one you never click on because you know it's gonna be boring. Even if it's important. It's like global warming. Global wapu? Look, I know it's important, I know it's real, but it's I never click on those articles anymore because I'm like, oh my god, could I be beaten over the head more with it? It's, like, it's fine. It's fine. Look, fine. I'll buy an electric car, you assholes. Just leave me alone. If you're selling that perfectly good car to buy a brand new Tesla, you're not doing a good deed. You're just buying a bright, shiny, ecologically problematic toy. According to California's Fish and Game Code, a fish is defined. Really? You're trying to get bees classified as fish? You walked in there, Rose. I am a fish. 400 times with a funny little dance and fainted. A wild fish, mollusk, crustacean, invertebrate, amphibian, or part, spawn, or ovum of any of those animals. While I'm disappointed that they use the word fish in its own definition, that definition that is really silly. I didn't even pick that up, but that's not very clever. That definition did include invertebrates. More importantly, it didn't specify that the invertebrates had to be aquatic. With this little loophole identified, the Xerxes Society was ready to petition the bumblebees to be added to Caesar's protected list of endangered fish. It sounds absurd, but it wasn't without precedence. The Trinity bristle snail is a protected species classified as a fish despite being a terrestrial invertebrate. Snails are also mollusks, so they would have been covered anyway, but it still showed that the Fish and Game Commission had the authority to classify a terrestrial invertebrate as a fish fish and they did in the state of california bees are now legally fish fish today's fish is trout a la creme enjoy your meal i will in terms of endangeredness in terms of biology no one's thinking that they're fish no one's like oh look at that nice fish my daughter my three-year-old daughter would be dad that's not a fish it's a bee and i'll be like well technically if we were in california that would be a fish She'd be like dad that's silly <laughs> no dad that's literally what she'd say. That's what she says. She says things are silly. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> it is silly. Now get on with it. While the judge's opinion stated that colloquially people often use the term fish to refer to aquatic life, the law didn't specify the definition, so there was no reason that the Fish and Game Commission couldn't choose to identify the bees as fish for the purposes of making them a protected species. Definitely don't do this. While no longer relevant in modern times, prohibition is responsible for one of my favorite legal loopholes ever. I know this one. <laughs> this is a good one. This is a good one. Oh, is this the one where they're... I'm gonna spoil it. You're spoiling it. But it's like, there's this like concentrated drink and it says like definitely don't leave this for 30 days in the open air with yeast inside because then it would make alcohol which is bad don't do that if you were to do that that'd be bad but that's what you would do if you wanted it it was illegal to make manufacture or transport alcohol but all of the ingredients were still totally legal it would be easy to go into the store and buy a bunch of grapes but how do you even make wine i'm guessing you couldn't go to the public library and take out a book on wine making without winding up on some sort of watch list so you'd have to settle for regular non-alcoholic grape juice instead dead. <laughs> Lame. In fact, people were allowed to make up to 200 gallons of non-alcoholic grape juice each year without taxation. I'm not exactly sure what taxes apply there, but I guess if you made over 200 gallons a year, it'd be considered a manufacturer. <laughs> load of wine, bro. <laughs> That's got to be like several bottles of wine a day. <laughs> He's not a man, he's a 
It would be considered a manufacturing operation or something that you'd have to pay associated business taxes for or whatever. Regardless, you could absolutely make regular grape juice, and companies were quick to help people out with definitely non-alcoholic recipes. The first was Fruit Industries, a company founded by the father of two vintners thanks to a $1.3 million loan, over $23 million loan today from the Federal Farm Board. To start, that's already a really suspicious name. Fruit Industries is the sort of painfully generic name that sounds like it can only exist as a fake company being used as a front for something like Boxes Incorporated, Product Manufacturers, or The Container Store. Anyway, Fruit Industries, the first product, was called Vine Glow, and it was a hit. The product was a brick of concentrated grapes, I knew I was on to this one, that could be used to make one gallon of delicious non-alcoholic juice. Other companies quickly followed suit, and grape bricks were a nationwide sensation. Of course, grape juice runs the risk of fermenting. Oh no! So it was important to include very specific instructions on how to handle these bricks in accordance with the law. There were also all different types of grapes that you could buy, and a label on a brick of Vino Sano grapes contained their recipe for grape juice. For port, Sherry and Angelica dissolve the brick into a gallon of water and add two pounds of sugar. For Rhine, Mascot and Burgundy do the same thing, but only add one pound of sugar. Now the next part was very important, so they put it in bright red text to make sure that the consumers would understand how to make sure their product did not turn into wine. Add one small teaspoon full of USP benzoate of soda to prevent fermentation. You must also avoid the use of any kind of yeast, raisins, etc. Otherwise, fermentation sets in. Oh no, not fermentation. What does that do? Oh no! They then told you to pour it into a clean bottle, put a small wad of loose cotton in the bottleneck, and let it sit in a warm place for three weeks. It was very important to follow all those directions precisely, especially the parts about adding sodium benzoate and definitely not adding yeast. <laughs> the fact that everything else sounds exactly like the recipe for making wine is as irrelevant as the fact that Vino Sano translates to unadulterated wine. <laughs> These products were taken to court multiple times, but every time they won. Yeah, they're not breaking the law. It's amazing. Respecting the law, respecting the law. After all, it wasn't illegal to sell grapes, and they weren't telling people how to make wine. They were telling people how not to make wine. And there just happened to be an incredible amount of overlap in those instructions. This is, it is absolutely, it's one of my favorites too, Kevin. I just love it. Following the raid of a store selling grape bricks, one newspaper ran the headline and subheading, Grape Juice Brick Turns to Wine If Not Used at Once. Consumers are solemnly warned to quickly drink preparation made from new grape bricks before it has a chance to turn into 13% wine. <laughs> you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? It's a good thing the entire country was taking prohibition super seriously. The Blind Side Gay marriage has been legal in Massachusetts for basically my entire adult life, but when I was a kid, such a thing was unspeakable. However, by the time I was born, the gay community had already figured out a neat little loophole for this problem. They couldn't be recognized as spouses, but they could still get a form of government acknowledgement for their relationship and some amount of legal protection by using adoption instead. Laws vary by state, and I'm not looking up all 50 of them, but in Massachusetts, it's perfectly legal to adopt any person younger than you so long as they're not your spouse. It's a far cry from the actual marriage benefits these couples would have wanted, but it was really sweet and rather clever. So now it's time for me to end this episode by ruining your day with a much more sinister adoption loophole. The adoption process can be long and it can be costly. If you're adopting somebody you already know and have consent from their parents or legal guardian, it should be pretty simple. But going through the system to take in a foster child can take anywhere between six months to seven years. Oh my god. I mean, I get that there should be some time because like that's a really important decision and a really big thing. And private adoption agencies can cost tens of thousands of dollars. Good lord. One of the reasons it takes so long is that they need to make sure that you're fit to adopt a child. Excellent! They need to run a standard background check, probably inspect your house and the room that the child will be staying in, and all of the other stuff that you'd certainly hope would happen when it comes to keeping children safe. Got no problems here. This all sounds great. Kevin's gonna ruin it, isn't he? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> It's important to have these sorts of safeguards in place to protect the vulnerable, however, they do have their limitations. All of the rules and regulations only apply to people going through the formal adoption process. I don't feel like there should be an informal adoption process. That sounds like something that should definitely have lots of government regulation. Unlike my f 
fucking garage. What happens if somebody adopts a child and realizes that they've gotten in way over their head? It turns out that they can simply rehome the child the same way that they would rehome a puppy that they no longer wanted. In a way, it makes sense. Like I said, it's easy to adopt a specific person that isn't already in the system. It's not unusual for someone to be adopted by their grandparents, aunt, uncle, or even a trusted friend for a variety of legitimate reasons, and that really isn't a difficult process. However, adoption rehoming is an easy way for abusers and human traffickers to take in foster children while avoiding the traditional adoption process. It's basically taking the two different forms of adoption and combining them in the worst way possible. While there's still the requisite amount of paperwork to make the adoption legal, there are no background checks, inspections, or anything like that. There, there, there should be. This loophole allows traffickers to completely circumvent all of that red tape, and Child Protective Services only steps in if they have reason to believe that a child is being abused. The worst part is that the people rehoming these children seem to fully understand who their target audience is. No fucking shot. This is still how it is. That's insane. That's insane. If someone was genuinely overwhelmed after an adoption and wanted to get across the message that the child wasn't an obnoxious little shit that had been terrorizing them for months, they might describe the child as polite, well-behaved, or respectful. You know, something to get across the idea that they're a good kid, but being a parent was more than you bargained for. In these ads, however, you're much more likely to see words like compliant, or obedient. Does anybody else feel really uncomfortable? Not all the people looking to rehome their adopted children have malicious intent, but that doesn't mean the people asking for them don't. One horror story involved a couple that had adopted a girl from Liberia who had severe health and behavioral problems. It became too much, so they posted an internet ad to get rid of her. Oh yeah, most adoption rehomings are arranged online with people who have never met one another. So that's fun. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Anyway, the Liberian girl wound up being signed over to a couple who were 100% not allowed to adopt children the traditional way. In fact, their two biological children had been taken away from them because they were psychotic abusers. How the fuck is this allowed? This doesn't seem like a loophole. This seems like insanity. Insane! It's a horrible situation. I don't really know how or when the problem is going to be solved. How about you just make it illegal, America? What the so yes, now you know there's a loophole in the American adoption laws that basically makes child trafficking legal. Sorry about that. That's madness! This episode ended on a really dark note, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> it is silly.